Hello and welcome to this, which is the first in a series of interviews with the leadership of the PLUS Alliance. This is a unique university global consortium set up about four years ago and bringing together the universities of New South Wales, Arizona State University and King's College London. Today, my conversation is going to be with the leader of King's, Professor Sir Ed Byrne. He has been president and principal of King's College London for almost the last seven years. So Ed, welcome. I'm very happy and honored to have this opportunity for a conversation with you. I'd like to spend some time obviously on the PLUS Alliance, but before we get to that, perhaps I could just ask you about your earlier years. What were the influences in your childhood that caused you to shape your career in the way that you did? Well, thank you very much, Malcolm. And can I say what a privilege and pleasure it is to uh, talk to you uh, uh, beginning this uh, Friday morning in a rather dull London. Um, I grew up, uh, as you know, in the north of England. Uh, my father was a GP. Uh, in a seaside town called South Shields uh, of Tyneside. Uh, he'd been in the army uh, during the Second World War and had met uh, quite a number of Australians uh, in the desert. Uh, and he'd always been taken for some reason with the desire to move to Australia. So at the age of 15, I found myself on a, a converted liner uh, uh, on our way to uh, Australia. Uh, and uh, since then, I've split my time between Australia and the UK, but mainly in Australia. Um, I was one of those people who wasn't completely sure about what I wanted to do as a young person and eventually did follow my father into medicine, uh, but there we diverged. Uh, he was a psychiatrist in the latter part of his career and I went for neurology, uh, perhaps not so far away, but a rather different speciality. Uh, and I realized um, fairly early on, mainly when working at the Institute of Neurology in London, now part of UCL, uh, that we uh, knew so little uh, about brain illness. Uh, and it led me towards the idea that I wanted research and uh, perhaps um, even modest contributions to new knowledge to be part of my career. So I, uh, I developed a career in medicine, which I enjoyed enormously, uh, where I, I had a role in diagnosis and treatment of patients, often with relatively rare illnesses, but at the same time I had research labs that were discovering new things about the causes of those illnesses. And uh, I have to say that was immensely satisfying. Uh, and that uh, research angle is what led me into mainstream university life. So Ed, I have to ask, why would a distinguished academic with a strong track record in research turn towards leadership and management? Um, Ed, what is it that turned you? <laughs> I don't think I woke up one day thinking uh, I want to be a vice chancellor. I, uh, uh, you know, uh, the most important thing to me was that the vice chancellor didn't know who I was, so I could get on with my <laughs> my business without having administrative duties uh, put upon me. Uh, and uh, it, it just the um, the nearer science. Uh, institute and activities I was leading at the University of Melbourne got bigger and bigger and bigger and, and budgets got larger and larger and larger uh, and I remember uh, Professor David Pennington who was a mentor of mine who had just stepped down as vice chancellor in Melbourne but shared my advisory board telling me that I needed to get some management training and understand what a balance sheet actually was. So I, uh, I did that. I did an MBA through one of Australia's best business schools. I did a part time, it took me two and a half years. Uh, and uh, out of that, I became interested perhaps in strategic leadership. Uh, and then uh, a colleague uh, who I knew quite well had just taken on the vice chancellor of Monash University and through an appointment process he convinced me to become his dean of medicine and health sciences uh, and that was a huge entity with a budget even then of about 500 million Australian dollars uh, and I realized that I couldn't really continue to run research labs and see patients I've been acting as a neurologist until that time uh, and give um, 
you know, give the attention it needed to a, a senior academic leadership role. So I, I made a decision. Uh, I, I continue to uh, attend research seminars and have some association with my old research group for some years. Um, I wound my clinics back to once a month in a speciality area where I had some international reputation. Uh, and that was my life until I joined you and you became my boss uh, at UCL uh, some years later. Um, at UCL, as you know, the, um, the health empire there, I think empire, I think is a, is a justifiable word because of its size uh, is just enormous. Uh, and under your leadership, uh, it was consolidating and uh, increasing its level of ambition. Uh, and I couldn't do all of the work I had to do for you uh, and still see patients and uh, run research labs directly. So that was the first time in my career uh, when I began to concentrate exclusively on university leadership. So do you think that um, university presidents always should have a strong academic background? Well, I think that's a question that often comes up and I you know, I, I bet uh, every uh, great university when they're doing their search now have some uh, non-academic leaders of immense uh, character and uh, incredible uh, distinguishment uh, on their list. Uh, I, I, all I'd say is that understanding universities deeply, it's a huge um, advantage uh, if you have an academic background. Uh, you may be able to compensate for that by expertise in other areas, uh, but in the end, the core mission of great universities is research and education, transforming the world, uh, and uh, a, a deep grounding in academia uh, gives one a capacity to understand and influence the academic community, uh, the whole university community, but the academic community in particular, uh, in a way that is much harder for somebody who, does, who comes from outside the university world. Not impossible for them, you know, they can acquire those skills, uh, but they are very dependent on others, I think, to do some of the leadership work that traditionally would be done by a vice chancellor. So I, I, I think it's a huge advantage to have an academic background. Uh, you know, there are uh, examples of successful vice chancellors who haven't come from academia. Um, if you look at vice chancellors who've succeeded in change management and in making a step change in the academic performance of their institutions. All of them, with only one exception I can think of, come from an academic background. I agree, and I think we may actually have the same exception in mind. But you're a bit unusual, aren't you, Ed? You have um, been the president of two leading universities of Monash in Australia and, and now King's. What is it that enables you to move so seamlessly between these two different jurisdictions? I, I think there are um, more similarities between Australia and New Zealand and the UK uh, than most uh, university national ecosystems, if I can use that much uh, abused word. I think it would have been harder to go to the US or even Canada, uh, but the Australian uh, and I think the New Zealand system, you're better able to comment on that, uh, is transplanted uh, almost directly from organisational structures in the UK. I mean, in Australia, it's a mixture of Scotland uh, and England, you know, in uh, various mixes among the great institutions. So you have uh, an almost identical academic uh, organisation uh, and broadly similar funding structures uh, and interactions with external parties and government. Um, and at the end of the day, of course, um, you know, for the 50 or so great universities of the world, possibly the 100 top world universities, uh, the similarity and mission uh, is overwhelming. You know, it's to educate young people well, to educate the leaders of the future across the professions and more generally, and to contribute research and innovation uh, in areas which is crucial to society at large. Uh, the uh, ability to deliver interdisciplinary research and education is almost unique uh, to the great universities uh, of the world. Uh, and if one looks at where the um, 
really significant advances that have transformed society have come from. They're certainly not all from universities, but the great majority are, you know, other than a few Nobel Prizes that have gone to Bell uh, uh, in the States. Uh, there are hardly any Nobel Prizes in the Nobel era in any discipline other than literature and the Peace Prize, obviously, uh, that have been awarded outside the university system. So, you know, I think there's a very tight family of great research universities uh, in the world uh, that are all pretty much on the same mission uh, and are an immensely positive force for a global mindset uh, at a time when uh, the old uh, demons of nationalism uh, are starting to rear their heads again. So it's nearly seven years since you took over at King's. I'm interested to understand what is it that you set out to do? What were your objectives? And um, what would you say had been your principal achievements over that period? Look, uh, I have to answer this in a fairly uh, brainstem or crude way. Uh, the, uh, the main ambition uh, that I had uh, when I started was to catch UCL. <laughs> That's a little in-joke between uh, Sir Markham and myself. <laughs> and uh, I think, uh, but to turn that into a, into a serious answer, um, you know, UCL had um, over some decades uh, transformed itself from always being an immensely significant institution, but a, a somewhat tribal London institution, you know, an institution sitting at the heart of uh, a country that had been at the center of the world for uh, such a long time. Uh, and uh, it had transformed itself in every way into one of the world's greatest universities, however measured. Um, King's, uh, when I came, I saw it had all of that opportunity um, you know, an equally distinguished university with a very similar history, uh, but it hadn't quite made the steps in recent decades that UCL had made uh, in terms of um, raising its level of ambition. Uh, and I think uh, speaking to a community that was absolutely ready for this, uh, it was possible to enunciate a vision uh, for a more ambitious position for Kings uh, in the university world uh, and a greater output uh, 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 relevant to both national and uh, global needs. Um, I did remember my uh, uh, early time uh, working with you uh, when you were building on the transformation of UCL uh, and the strength of your voice to the university community. Uh, and it strengthened a, a belief uh, I was already starting to form, but hadn't completely consolidated, uh, that the key thing in transforming great universities is transforming the culture. Uh, and uh, I think I have succeeded, you know, building on the achievements of others, obviously, because these jobs are, uh, you, you know, you, you follow uh, good people and hopefully good people follow you. But I think I've succeeded in raising the level of aspiration for Kings, such as Kings now justifiably thinks of itself as one of the truly great universities uh, of the world, which it is, you know, I think now, however measured. Uh, the other thing I've been interested to do at Kings is to develop a vision which is, you know, very strong academically, uh, which I think was always there, uh, but which differentiated itself a little bit from some of the other great universities, such as Oxford and Cambridge, possibly to some extent UCL, although that can be uh, that can be argued, uh, because I think there are great similarities there. Uh, but um, the um, it, it was to develop a, a vision of King's uh, as a university that was highly aligned uh, with the UN uh, SDGs. And our mutual friend Michael Crow uh, influenced me uh, somewhat uh, in that direction. Uh, and a university that was highly aligned with the civic needs of London. Uh, so I elevated what I call a service agenda, uh, which is really uh, an agenda around the great themes of the time encompassed by the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and a civic agenda centered around London uh, as key differentiating features, absolutely front and center uh, in the strategic planning of the university. Uh, and one outcome for that, which I'm really proud of, is that um, the Times Higher, you know, one of the two major ranking uh, uh, bodies internationally for universities, um, a couple of years ago brought out a, um, 
a new ranking against the uh, SDGs uh, with quite a number of measurables, about 10, uh, very robust, and some 800 of the world's great universities, almost all of them have taken part in this. Uh, and on both occasions, King's has been second in the UK, at one place behind Manchester, which was first, and one expects Manchester to do well because of its immensely strong regional links. Um, world top 10 uh, and third in Europe. And I think for a traditional, you know, London Institute with the type of uh, historical real estate that Kings has in part, uh, that's quite a significant achievement. It, it measures things like uh, equality and diversity, attention uh, on environmental issues, uh, sustainability across the board, uh, productivity and links with uh, local business and industry, you know, a range of, range of really robust measures. Um, and I've tried to refocus Kings a little uh, in a more forward looking way. Uh, I know we're about to come to the plus alliance, but the example of uh, the other two institutions in plus, uh, which are both quintessentially civic and quintessentially engaged in the great questions of the time uh, has been another driver for me to try to take Kings uh, a little bit in that direction. So you took on quite a conservative institution at Kings and your achievements there have been widely recognized and respected, actually not least uh, by Her Majesty the Queen who recently conferred upon you a knighthood for your services to higher education. But I've got this question, which is one of the achievements that I would rank obviously quite highly is the foundation of the Plus Alliance. What is it that convinced you that a consortium like this was going to be a good thing to do? Well, obviously uh, it wasn't uh, just me. It was very much uh, a collective effort with uh, colleagues in Sydney uh, and in Phoenix. Uh, but um, it, it was how I've come to think about university life. You know, uh, if one goes to the basics, uh, a very famous Canadian vice chancellor, university president once said that, you know, in our world, uh, much more is talked about than is done. It's our responsibility in our time of leadership to make sure that things are done. Uh, and I, I'd lost, uh, I, I mean, I see these very broad university consortia are certainly important because you, you get to speak to colleagues and you know what's going on in other parts of the world. Uh, but I hadn't, I hadn't seen much of depth uh, come out of them. Uh, and I became interested in the idea of depth alliances with like-minded institutions, uh, which would strengthen global outlooks uh, 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 around the major issues of the planet uh, and bring uh, a level of resource uh, that couldn't be brought by a single institution. Now, one could argue, why not just do that nationally? Why not have uh, the great University of the South of England do that? Um, I think there are clear advantages uh, in global mindset uh, to linking up with like-minded institutions in other parts of the world. Uh, and um, survival is the issue uh, because at the end of the day, it all depends on good academic outputs um, drawing in enough funding uh, to support them. Uh, but I think with a high enough level of ambition, uh, with engagement, uh, not just cosmetic, but real engagement of the university community uh, across, uh, in this case, three continents with PLUS, uh, and with clear focus uh, on the major problems of the age, uh, with a level of contribution that draws support from outside parties, including government, uh, the chance of ongoing viability uh, is really strong. So just a minute, why these two universities of all the thousands of universities in the world, why these two? I mean, I have thought about that because uh, uh, you know, an equally viable model uh, would be uh, to partner with a university in China and, and India, say. Uh, uh, and uh, with, with these universities, a driver for me was that their, their level of quality uh, and their level of ambition and the way they thought about the world was very similar. Um, because um, if one doesn't have that, as you know well, Malcolm, these alliances don't stick. You know, I mean, it's sort of uh, absolutely known that uh, those universities that have safes, I think UCL might still have one. 
have, uh, have in their safe metaphorically are the hundreds or thousands of agreements you know signed with other institutions uh, that either do uh, little uh, or nothing uh, and um, it, you, you have to have um, an agreement with individuals who think about the world in, in a similar enough way that they're willing to take a chance and commit some of their personal capital and some of the material assets of their institution to the partnership. And then if that happens, you have a real chance. Uh, in this particular story, the plus story, and of course you're very involved in that as the chair of our advisory board, um, I think the two other university presidents, uh, you know, Ian Jacobs, who you know, comes to the University of New South Wales, a great institution uh, as a transformative uh, vice chancellor. Uh, and then the um, figure of Michael Crow, who uh, I would regard as, you know, one of the most uh, influential university leaders uh, of recent times, uh, who thinks laterally, uh, is incredibly ambitious, uh, and um, is someone who is always interested in new ways of doing things if they give better outcomes. Um, I guess one worry is when you have three committed leaders and a supportive board and things are happening, because I'm sure as we'll come to in this interview, great things have been happening through PLUS. Uh, when one of them moves on, i.e. me, you know, what happens to the alliance? Uh, and I'm absolutely convinced that I'll call it plus thinking, global thinking, is now so strongly embedded in King's uh, that uh, ongoing support and commitment for plus uh, will be part of King's, uh, I'll use the, again the old hackneyed phrase, DNA uh, in the years ahead. That leads me to this really challenging question, which is I get the vision and the leadership of the three university presidents. And, and, and the rhetoric and the way in which they can come together and provide strong leadership. What is it though that you use in order to embed the whole concept and operation of the PLUS Alliance within the community of your own university? As you, as you know, Malcolm, certainly uh, in UK universities, I, I, I think it is the same in the other countries too. Uh, before one can commit to a, a massive project like this, one needs to build up quite a degree of support in the institution uh, from the academic community, uh, from the university leadership, more as importantly, if not more so, from the university council. So one has to be able to describe the story in a cogent uh, and convincing way uh, to convince one's own institution that the other two universities are equally enthusiastic in engaging in the project. And, these stories advance in, uh, in, uh, in, in parallel, as it were, uh, and to be fairly early uh, on the board and the, and the course to do two things. So one, to engage significant numbers of the leading uh, academics and scientists in the three institutions and joint projects. And through the PLUS fellowships, we've been very successful in doing that. If you look at the three institutions, many of the very strongest uh, academics in many disciplines have engaged uh, and then to have uh, some big projects that are successful that one can point to uh, that would have been very difficult for uh, any of the institutions to do alone and the the one that stands out at this stage with plus there will be others uh, but the one that stands out is the incredibly exciting teddy initiative uh, in the uh, docklands uh, area of london I can see that Teddy is obviously a great innovation and the three universities have worked closely on it together. I'm also interested to understand what have you learned from your interactions with the other two universities and their respective presidents? I'd say uh, two, two things to me stand out. The, um, well, perhaps three, you know, the first, the ability to enter into strategic partnerships at scale that individual countries wouldn't have uh, and the attractiveness uh, of a multinational university consortium that has real depth uh, in that regard. Uh, secondly, uh, as the world pivots to uh, online education and uh, you, you know, uh, Arizona State uh, is probably the world leader in, uh, in online education among universities, ASU. Um, as the world pivots uh, more rapidly in that direction post COVID, uh, than one would have imagined possible even a short time ago. Uh, the level of expertise and the level of joined 
joinedness, joined upwardness uh, in plus uh, around uh, e-education uh, is so strong and so immense uh, that I think it positions the consortium incredibly well to be an increasingly strong international player. And thirdly, and this is perhaps more mundane than the other two things, um, what I found is that being able to get under the bonnet of other institutions, uh, not just the university leader, but you know, going quite a way uh, through the staff of the three institutions has been immensely uh, helpful. Um, uh, things you learn about university organization that differ a little in different countries. Uh, things you learn about how to bring flexibility uh, in uh, perhaps uh, to more traditional areas. Uh, but I'll mention uh, the COVID epidemic. You know, the uh, United States uh, was exposed um, in a major way to COVID in their universities uh, a little before the UK uh, because their academic year starts earlier. Uh, and the way that uh, ASU had you know, been so uh, uh, leading in, uh, in working out how to keep the university going and get students back in, in the face of endemic COVID and COVID spikes is something we learned an enormous amount from at King's. Uh, one thing I learned is uh, you can't uh, keep great universities open uh, in the face of any significant level of COVID uh, without asymptomatic testing regularly for all staff and students. You know, as happens at ASU. Um, I, I was almost a lone voice in the Russell Group uh, putting that proposition for a while. Now, of course, the government has come to accept it. Um, the, um, also, I think we've learned from both you, NSW, and uh, ASU at King's uh, that um, the willingness to take a little bit more measured risk, um, to be a little bit more, uh, or a lot more at times, ambitious. Uh, in terms of the scope and output of partnerships uh, in a way that is not natural uh, for UK universities uh, is, uh, is an incredibly uh, exciting thing. So it's true, obviously, that COVID has had an enormous impact on all of us, on the way we live, on the way we work, and in particular on universities, which are accustomed to bringing together large numbers of people, of students and of faculty, and are gathering places, particularly of young people. What has been the impact of COVID on your university? And more interestingly, I suppose, is what do you see as being the long-term impact of COVID on higher education globally? I think um, you know, hugely challenging uh, in the short term, uh, but full of promise uh, in the medium term, I'm talking about the COVID effects. Uh, what we saw uh, in the short term, uh, I'll just say generally, you know, universities are, um, are internally uh, very, very conservative uh, institutions uh, and uh, small uh, incremental changes uh, sometimes seem very significant to university communities that in other organisations would be regarded as uh, is not so large uh, in terms of quantum. Uh, so with that background, it might perhaps be a little surprising, you know, I don't know if one would have predicted this, to look at how flexible the great universities have been in the face of the COVID crisis, moving all teaching online uh, within days, uh, examinations uh, carried out online, case, case really everywhere uh, where COVID has been pronounced and there's been national lockdowns. Um, in the case of King's, and this would apply to uh, all the plus uh, institutions uh, and to others, uh, pivoting research with, with, with the great researchers of the university, uh, willing to uh, change the research focus overnight to, uh, to COVID related themes. Uh, then, you know, immunologists like uh, Adrian Hayday, one of the great immunologists of the UK, uh, suddenly moving from uh, long established areas to working on T cells in, uh, in COVID. And you know, that's now of great significance. Um, individuals starting to design ventilators who were working on something completely different. Uh, psychiatrists and psychologists pivoting their research to the post COVID mental health of the nation. Um, uh, individuals like Tim Spector, whose expertise is uh, genetics and twin studies, uh, working with engineers to develop an app that has some 
you know, many, many millions of people uh, involved um, and has given insights into the uh, phenomenology of uh, COVID-19 as an illness. It goes on and on. And uh, uh, where will it be out of this? Well, I hope one, I hope the general public and politicians understand better than they have done the importance of the university sector to the nation. You know, that varies in importance in different countries, but it is an issue. Uh, two, um, the flexibility of the university system, which has been forced by COVID, isn't lost. Uh, and universities continue to concentrate in the most major way on the most relevant and important problems. Uh, and three, uh, that the uh, more porous nature of universities forced by uh, COVID, which was already happening, the interaction with government and industry, uh, it continues to be accelerated. Uh, I think of this a little like the Second World War, uh, which was the last event of equivalent significance to COVID in, uh, in, in, in our planet, planetary history. Uh, the Second World War was still a more disruptive event than COVID, but uh, COVID is probably the major disruption since then. And, you know, out of the Second World War came uh, changes in the structure of society, uh, uh, massive advances in technology, uh, and really uh, the world moved into a very different phase quite rapidly. Uh, I suspect that we will see that happen uh, with the COVID pandemic, and I expect that universities will be at the forefront uh, as the new uh, stories are written. Ed, we started our conversation talking about your early years, and now I want to go to the other end, which is that you're about to stand down as president of King's College London. Ed, what are you going to do next? <laughs> I'm going to do some interesting things. I'm interested in, uh, in health, and I'm interested in the, uh, you know, the higher education dash university sector. So I, I've taken an advisory role with an international health company, uh, around uh, health system design, very much a part-time role. Uh, and I've taken an academic role as a distinguished uh, professorial fellow at ANU, uh, working across the Distinguished Policy Institute and health schools uh, around health uh, policy. Can I say just what an enormous pleasure it has been today at talking to you and understanding what it is that you've been able to do at King's College London and that great part of your legacy, which is the creation of the PLUS Alliance. Thank you for this insightful and revealing conversation. Well, thank you very much, Malcolm, and thank you also for the leadership uh, you're showing uh, in the PLUS project.